Hello, I'm Warren Shiel and I'm with uh, Lucy Greenwood, a UK solicitor. Thanks very much for coming on, Lucy. You're welcome. Um, as you know, I'm a family law attorney in Los Angeles, California, and uh, Lucy's a UK solicitor in London with the International Family Law Group, LLP. I can tell that because there's a, a background. Behind me, yeah. <laughs> Lu Lucy, tell me a bit more about your practice. Okay, so we're based in Covent Garden. Obviously, at the moment, we're not based in Covent Garden. We're all at, we're all working remotely from home, um, and we've been going probably about twelve years or so. Um, and basically, it was started by two partners that remain partners, um, Anne Thomas and David Hodgson, who's OBE in family law too, and they founded the um, firm because. There was a real um, dearth of experience in relation to international family law issues and so in addition to helping on a national level which we do as well obviously um, we have developed a particular specialism in international family law work and most of our clients have an international dimension either through residents uh, or if they're working in in england temporarily or um, if they're living abroad um, if the spouse is abroad um, and so it, it, it's, um, you know, it's become a real um, developing area, um, not only in terms of the amount of work, but also the type of work. It's so fascinating to see the different um, types of laws and how they interact. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's certainly not something that uh, a lot of people still understand fully. Um, and so we, we remain um, ahead in relation to those sorts of issues um, throughout London and we do a lot of work training not only uh, lay clients but also other lawyers um, in London and England about international family law work. One thing that's um, I, I mean I started out as a, a solicitor in the United Kingdom many years ago um, I don't practice there anymore I just practice in California uh, one thing that I read about in the papers um, is that London and the UK is a divorce capital of the world. What does that mean and, and why is London the divorce capital of the world? We are comparatively very generous to the weaker financial party in England. Um, and as a consequence, our international work is also probably more uh, prevalent uh, than it, it would be in other, say, European countries where their laws are very similar. Because we stand out, that means that certain people don't want to divorce here and others obviously do. And therefore our jurisdiction work is probably more rife than other parts of the world. But primarily that name is given because we are generous, uh, not only in terms of capital, but also maintenance. Um, so for example, in most countries, the categorization of assets is very clear and certain assets like pre-acquired assets or gifted assets would never come into the equation um, as a marital pot. But in fact, in England, everything comes into the pot. And if there's enough just on strict marital assets to divide equally and meet everybody's needs, uh, as the courts interpret them, which is based on standard of living, so that's a bit of a wide concept, um, then if it doesn't meet their needs, then you can dip into these other assets in, in order to supplement as it were um, and so people have to be very careful if they're coming to England um, and uh, they don't realise that certain assets including inheritance may not be completely ring fenced and furthermore we are very generous on maintenance so we still have joint lives maintenance uh, for couples although it's increasingly rare and Basically, that means that you could be paying spousal maintenance as well as child maintenance indefinitely or until um, the spouse that requires it um, can become independent and they may not be able to become independent. Um, increasingly, we're doing term orders for maintenance now, um, which still can sometimes be extendable. So it's, it's sort of joint lives through the back door with a bit more scope for trying to stop going on forever but um yes yeah, so and we share pensions um so yeah i mean that's really why we've got that reputation um and as i say if you are the stronger financial party you 
want to see if there is somewhere else you can divorce generally. Uh, and if you're the weaker financial party, people literally forum shop here or find a way to move to England for the necessary period uh, before they can start proceedings here. So whilst we try not to encourage that behaviour, and forum shopping is not a, you know, it's not a nice concept, um, there's a lot of that that goes on, yeah. What's well, interesting um, and some major differences with uh, California law and most jurisdictions in the US. Um, you, you talk about capital, we tend to talk about assets. So that, as you said, um, in California, for example, assets are community assets, which are assets acquired during the marriage, um, are presumptively community property, which is split 50-50. So you're saying your capital or your assets could actually be split unequally. Um, including pre-marriage assets or inheritance and gifts. And then you said that, that was based on need. Um, it, can, you, can you elaborate on what that means, based on need, what the standard right. is? Right, well, there's one, there's one piece of legislation called the Matrimonial Causes Act, which has um, a number of sections in it, um, section 25 and subsections, which talks about the types of things that are taken into account when making an assessment. Um, and basically it is it is a unique review of somebody's um, financial circumstances and takes into account the standard of living they've enjoyed during the marriage um, you know what their earning capacity is going forward um, you know what needs they have and we do budgets um, based predominantly on the standard of living enjoyed and consequently the budget may not be what some might deem needs, um, but are needs in the context of that particular family. And so it's a very elastic and very discretionary um, kind of uh, measure. Um, and then you sort of cross check the budgets by the party's income, see what they can afford, um, and you come to a figure basically. So there's no formula for spousal maintenance. There is some formula for child maintenance if you're earning um, below a certain level. Um, and you both live in England, um, but otherwise we have no formulaic approach to family law at all. It is very discretionary and therefore not something you want to necessarily leave for the courts to decide uh, because it's very hard to know what courts will do. And one judge may order something quite different from another judge. Um, and so increasingly um, res you know, dispute resolution, alternative resolutions are being used um, in England. Do you have any figures or statistics on how many cases are resolved through ADR or through litigation? I don't have um, those statistics, but I would say with COVID, um, there is an increasing move towards um, using dispute resolution. And generally, after years of trying to encourage mediation, um, it is actually taking off far more now. And a lot of couples are trying we also have, I don't know if you have it in California, we have some organisations now where um, parties that are not contesting anything and want to just do it very amicably can actually go to one person who will draw up consent or Obviously there's lots of red flags um, associated with that kind of approach, but people are being trying to be more and more creative and using um, technology to um, uh, provide information about their circumstances far more uh, than they were previously. Yeah, we have a system, we have a very interesting system actually in terms of alternate dispute resolution. Um, there's really two main track or three. One is mediation by often uh, attorneys who are mediators, their family attorneys who mediate and then they draft an agreement advise the client to seek independent counsel to review that or indeed they can bring in independent counsel as part of the mediation process. Um, at another high level um, we also have a lot of organizations which consist of retired family court judges um, and they also do mediation or voluntary settlement conferences. Um, those cases tend to be um, heard um, where the case has been in litigation both sides have attorneys um, and they seek to do a voluntary settlement conference uh, for mm -hmm. a day or two. Um, I suppose we've, we've, had, uh, a, we've had a judge in who is a, uh, does voluntary settlement conferences and we've talked to mediators and both, both um, uh, types of mediation have their advantages. Um, mm -hmm. 
and then we have uh, something which is kind of unusual. I don't know if the UK has this. Um, we have private charging, uh, which means that if you want to opt out of the public system, you can appoint a private judge to decide your case. Um, did you have that or anything like that? We have very similar, actually, to all of those things. So um, in addition to the standard mediation, which is obviously a completely voluntary process, um, we have um, an early evaluation, early neutral evaluation process called what we call a financial dispute resolution process. Now, that's traditionally part of the procedure. So again, when proceedings are afoot, that would be our second hearing after a directions hearing to get disclosure. Um, and that is also either done through the court and an actual judge giving an indication whereupon they can't see anything else about the case thereafter or by a private judge if you like which is usually a senior barrister or a senior solicitor or um, a retired judge um, and they similarly give an indication and the benefit of those private FDRs as we call them mean that you have a much more comfortable setting, it's private, um, and actually they stand a far greater chance of settling because the judge in question has the whole day rather than the system within the court where they can have four or five in a day, which really is pretty tough for them and does mean that you're feeling that sort of pressure in a not very pleasant environment. So um, there's that. We also have um, arbitration. So we can have a binding arbitration agreement. In fact, David Hodson of our firm uh, introduced the idea of arbitration for family law and it is taking off increasingly. And where we have so, so many holdups with the court system and that's increasing because the resources are so poor, um, this is another alternative to having private judging like you. Um, and so we can, it can either be on a preliminary issue or it can be the whole thing. Um, and that is then a binding agreement which can be made into a consent order which the courts will recognise. So the courts work with, alongside those dispute resolution um, approaches and are very supportive of them. Um, so if you reached a private FDR, conclu you know, concluded private FDR, the judge would in all, in all probability say that's absolutely fine and accept that um, as an order, albeit all of our orders have to go through a judge to confirm that they deem them fair. Uh, whatever that is again with the uh, discretion that they have so most settlements are encouraged and are supported by the judge um once the for the order to be made so there's lots one, of alternatives one thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about is uh, where you where judges come from in california um, judges come from all over the place um, we don't have a bifurcated system where we have barristers and solicitors we just have attorneys and so a lot of family, some family court judges um, used to be family court attorneys before they became judges. Um, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of judges who come from big firms, maybe managing partners in civil litigation firms. Uh, we, we have ex-district attorneys who become family court judges. And, and, and it's a very difficult posting because of the volume of cases and the demands on a family court judge. Where, where do your family court judges come from, typically? Um, they can be solicitors or barristers. Um, we don't have judging judges school like they do in Europe. Um, in Europe, you actually take a course either in being a lawyer or a judge. Um, so we don't Not have a bad that. Idea. Not a bad yeah. idea. Um, and so, yes, I mean, it's, it's generally um, you know, coming from the actual bar or the solicitors uh, practices themselves. So, for example, um, David sits as a deputy district judge. Um, in the uh, Central Family Court quite frequently. Um, so yes, I mean, that's really how ours are, are grown. Um, and we're fortunate in Central London that we have quite a few specialist family judges. I think it's, I think out of all the High Court judges, there are about 17 specialist um, uh, family judges. And so that does mean that there is, unlike some areas where people may not have the experience of some of the more complicated financial matters, in central London, we're quite fortunate with the calibre and the expertise that the judges have in family law matters. And how, is, how has this uh, pandemic affected the, the functioning of the court system in London? Well, it's not been altogether straightforward. Um, and the courts have tried very hard to adapt. 
they were well behind on IT issues um, before COVID. They were starting to get in place a system for remote hearings, which they were comfortable with and that was secure. Um, but it wasn't in, hasn't been put into practice. And this has really um, it accelerated that approach. So we have remote hearings. We have some telephone hearings. We have um, a system called, I think it's CBC, I should know that, uh, which is the new court system or CVP, I think. And um, that is similar to Zoom or Teams or whatever, uh, and, but it's the court's own system. And so you can have breakout rooms and um, ways in which to talk to your client um, and uh, to the judge when you all need to be in the room together. So it's taking a bit of practice. Um, the courts are way behind on their lists because you just can't see as many uh, cases. Um, they're only tending to do directions hearings that way. They are still anxious about doing full blown hearings, although some are trying because of the evidence um, being given and it's not always easy to ensure everyone's in the room on their own and things like that. Um, so yes, it's not been without its difficulties. Um, we are doing more and more online. We're being encouraged to do more and more online. We are a bit behind on that front um, compared to many countries. So we can do an online divorce petition now. We will shortly be able to do a non-contested consent order online just for the judges to, to review as paper. Um, so there are some developments, um, but it's 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 taking time. And because the courts have been closed, things are definitely taking longer to process. So the courts are not doing in-person hearings, but they're just doing online hearings? At the moment. There are a few in-person hearings, but they are very few. They were one of the last people to actually shut down, or one of the last bodies to shut down. Um, and it was generating concern because the lawyers were getting nervous and the staff were getting nervous about going into court. Um, but for the, most of the duration of the lockdown, they have not opened. They are opening gradually now and they are having some hearings, but it's not still not commonplace. And children matters are taking priority in family courts. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a good thing because it's made everybody step up and you know the, the electronic bundling and things like that has really come on. Um, but um, it's the system isn't quite or wasn't quite ready for this explosion. Um, so it's it, there's been a few teething issues. Now, it, how now the UK obviously everyone knows of, about Brexit and that uh, Britain is. I don't know if you still call it Britain or you or the UK. I still call it Britain because I'm old fashioned. But um, and that's probably when I left when it was still Great Britain. Um, but um, how's, uh, how's pulling out of a Europe going to affect matrimonial law? Is it going to affect oh, matrimonial law? Right, well, we are debating that. And we are, um, in fact, you know, we've, uh, David's just written a book about um, England leaving the EU. And even up to 24 hours before it had to be submitted, things were still developing and changing. We do not know quite what impact it's going to have. We're going to be relying more on... Um, the Hague 2007 for reciprocal enforcement. Mm. Um, and we are obviously no longer party of the, um, of the EU law, which we've been using, but because we haven't got time to change all of our laws, we are still have it retaining some of the EU law. Um, but because we're no longer part of EU anymore, whilst we might, um, do things slightly differently, we don't know how, European countries are going to react to our approach um, and whether that's going to be reciprocated. So there's a lot up in the air at the moment. Um, we are working, um, or the government is working, to try to uh, work out how best to use the other legislation we have or to become a signatory in our own right, because many of these conventions we, we belong to as part of the EU. Uh, and it is causing some problems and it's causing some headaches. And yeah, I think probably I can't tell precisely what's going to happen. Um, and we were unlikely to know for, for a little time yet, but we've got some guidance and we are watching carefully, but it, it, isn't, it isn't straightforward and it is going to cause some complications. There's also debate as to which courts conduct can actually 
um, diverge or depart from EU law, whether that should just be our Supreme Court or in fact, um, whether it, the Court of Appeal or even High Court should have a say, because the access to justice aspect for family means that very few families go to the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court because they can't afford to. Mm -hmm. And the issues are going to become very live and very common in the lower courts. So there's actually just been a consultation paper on that, which we've contributed to. And it is a very difficult decision to make because you, on the one hand, you want uniformity uh, and on the other, you want change quickly so that the government knows what legislation to change and how. So, um, yeah, there's quite a lot of debate going on. Brexit, you know, just get it, you know, it's either COVID or Brexit at the moment, one way or another. Both it's are double, causing double whammy, as they say. Um, yeah. Is that going to, I would assume it's going to impact in some way uh, move away cases where you have uh, an EU spouse and a, a, a British spouse and uh, one of the parties wants to move back to uh, a European country. Um, well, particularly, I'm seeing a lot of cut people wanting to move back to New Zealand and Australia right now. Yeah. Um, and that's become a source of conflict. I mean, it, it, you'd have to have permission anyway throughout the EU to move countries with a child. Uh, you can't leave any, yeah. obviously, you can't leave any country. And, it, and even, even though England is quite small compared to America, sometimes there's even uh, disputes about whether someone moves from Cornwall to Scotland or, you know, or, or um, near Scotland, I should say, because it's still the same jurisdiction, it says a Newcastle. Um, so it's, um, it, is, it is going to increase. And COVID has actually also crystallise people's decisions, I think, about where they want to live with their children if they're separating. We have had an awful lot of inquiries for relocation work, of which we do a lot. Um, and yes, I mean, at one point we were just being inundated with queries and inquiries for relocation. So people are in the wrong part of the world at the moment and contacts not taking place as it should. Uh, you know, clients that have got children in America aren't seeing them and haven't seen them for months and that then changes the dynamic of how common it is for them to see the children and then people take advantage of those things, rightly or wrongly, and the courts are trying hard to stamp down on people trying to take advantage of COVID um, for these scenarios, but the reality is the child is not seeing the other parent for a long period of time. So it's having a big impact on the child, on the children aspect, certainly. Absolutely. Mm. Um, well, this is this is a really ter tremendous conversation. Do you have any questions about California law or U.S. law generally? We, I know before we started, we were talking briefly about prenups. I know we uh, have a very different uh, yeah. regimen on prenups. Um, we are probably California is the prenup capital of the world. It is. Yeah, I think it is. I've done some work with the Californian prenups previously, and they are quite large, um, certainly longer than most prenups. Um, but England's becoming, uh, England's are becoming longer, I have to say, because there are so many complexities to them. And uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see. Um, and actually, the Californian law is fairly generous without a prenup, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this is probably where they they were first introduced because of that um they're not binding in england like they are in california but they are increasingly popular they are very very useful documents for english proceedings well i can i can tell a, uh, someone who wants to get a california prenup and has uh, connections with the jurisdiction in california mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. follow all the formalities of the family code um and the premarital act then we're fairly confident that the prenup will be enforceable as long as the terms are not against public policy or unconscionable. Um, so I can say that with a fair degree of certainty. Um, with When you say, um, you know, a prenup in the UK is, is not necessarily enforceable, I do know there's some House of Lords or your Supreme Court cases that have upheld prenup. Yeah. So when a client comes to you and says, I want to do a prenup, tell me if it's going to be enforceable or not. What, what do you tell them? Right, well, we've got guidance. And there, since the case you're probably thinking about Rebmacher um, in 2010, um, there have been, uh, has been a movement. And basically the law has now said that provided what is suggested is fair um, and the parties acted in good faith, they entered into with their eyes open, full disclosure, uh, in good time before the marriage, we suggest about 28 days before 
the marriage um, and there's no, you know, as I say, undue coercion, um, then it is likely to be upheld. There's got to be a good reason not to. Um, the times when our courts will step in is if it again thinks that reasonable needs as it sees it haven't been met by the provision of the marital agreement and sometimes they don't actually interfere with the agreement they might instead use child maintenance which obviously can't be well i don't know if it's the same in california but in england yeah. you can't put that and and be, by, be bound by it in england um, and so we have quite robust powers for even um, unmarried families um, with children so the courts of married families also have these strong powers to make quite sizable orders for children um, and therefore they tend to interfere in that way there's also been a couple of cases where the actual um, approach to how you sign a prenup has had an impact so i know that for example countries where they are binding because there's no other way to um, sort of unravel or, or to um, defend them, you are reliant on looking at the sort of procedural aspects far more than you might otherwise be. And I know that um, in, you know, in certain countries, the way in which you sign a prenup is incredibly important. Um, and if that's not being met in some situations, then the courts have used that as an excuse to go behind it. Um, but they have to have this balance of what people want for themselves and choosing for themselves and it being fair. Um, and, and that's really how the English courts look at it. Uh, but, up, but increasingly they are being upheld. Um, and as long as they're not ridiculous, then, you know, they may well succeed. So when they're looking at fairness or notions of fundamental fairness, they're looking at reasonable needs based upon, you know, for example, their standard of living or what it costs to live in London which is a very expensive I mean, city, probably more yes, expensive than Los Angeles. It is. I mean, basically, it's what they're going to need to you know, meet their requirements. Um, but it's probably going to be um, tamed a little bit. So it's even if you don't succeed entirely on, uh, on, on uh, enforcing a premarital agreement, you are likely to curtail your um, provision because the judge will take into account that you had both agreed to this and you were quite comfortable with that idea at the time. So it's, you know, from many perspectives, it's useful. And also it means that you can set out the categories that you definitely do not want to touch. Um, and so unless again, they really are needed and there just isn't enough money to meet in any other way, they are more likely to be ring fenced um, in a way that um, you can't guarantee without one. They're very and useful. In child maintenance uh, in California, we have a program called DisoMaster, um, which is a computer program. And so in theory, it should be very simple. We put in these variables such as each party's income and the custodial timeshare, their parenting plan, and it, it spits out a figure. And so Bob's your uncle, you have your mm -hmm. child maintenance, or we call it child support. Um, but you only have guidelines, so you don't have a formula or a mathematical formula? We have a formula for child maintenance for national couples. So if you're both living in England um, and you earn, I think it's under 158,000, um, then you can use the child maintenance service formula. And that's based on you know, putting in a figure for your income, how much time you have with the children, and, and you know, as you say, a, a number popping out. Um, that is still used to an extent as guidance as a starting point even when there are international families um, but it's you're not bound by it the court can oh, decide child maintenance separately yeah and uh, another fact feature is that even after a year if you've agreed something between you that's not through the child maintenance service either party can then go to the child maintenance service a year later i'm really not sure why they still why they did that um because it can only deem to be unfair to one or other party if they're going to do better or worse in the child maintenance service. But, you know, that is the law as it stands at the moment. Um, they can retroactively ask for more money? Is that what you're saying? They can, after a year, yeah, after a year of having an order which they've agreed for child maintenance, after that year, they are allowed, if they're both nationals, to apply to the child maintenance service. So they might have agreed something in the context of their overall divorce, put it into a consent order, and then 12 months later, one or other of them decides that they're going to do better through the child maintenance service. So that's why we tend to start with the child maintenance service right. figure 
so that it's not going to be too disparate in if somebody changes it within a year. And um, that's one of the reasons we do that too. Um, yeah. It's interesting that, that, that you have different rules depending on whether it's two nationals or an international couple. Surely uh, the amount of child support or child maintenance is for the child and the child's living in the UK. Their needs don't really change, do they? Well, they don't, but there may be international contact. There may be other features. Um, and I guess it also takes into account that people's um, income in different countries might mean different things. But we still tend to start with that child maintenance figure if, it's, if the income isn't too high. Um, otherwise, we will just use a budget um, to work out child maintenance. In terms of um, unmarried couples, what's the situation in California? Do they have rights? Do they have rights akin to marriage? Yeah, they, the, if, if it's an unmarried couple um, and they have a child, a minor child under the age of 18, um, the rules as to custody, which is a best interests analysis test, um, and the rules on child support are exactly the same. I mean, the, the focus is very much upon the uh, the needs of the child. And so the child is always paramount. Um, at the only uh, difference, I, I would say the only unusual policy difference is that um, if you have high owner uh, couples, uh, usually um, uh, one of the couples is, is making more than about $1.2, $1.3 million a year, mm -hmm. uh, a different set of rules apply. And then um, we can depart from the, the standard guideline and the disaster mm -hmm. guideline um, and we, we do a calculation based upon the reasonable needs of the child uh, in accordance with their standard of living. The idea is that it would be unfair for the child to experience a different standard of living in, in one household. So, you know, that might also have an impact because, you know, let's say mum's mom's living in the valley in, in, in a studio apartment and father's living in a mansion in Beverly Hills and they have a private jet. It's, it's very unfair. If the, for the child to experience those two, two standards of living. So we try and sort of even that up to a certain extent. Um, and and do you that, also share, do you share capital? I mean, are they treated like married couples in every other way or, or is, is there no provision for the actual adults? No, there's no, if, if they're not married, there's no division of capital. Um, the only, um, the only, the way it will be treated or addressed would be in the calculation of support. Um, child support because there would be a, a reasonable return on, on investment on capital. Um, but other than that, um, and there's no such really thing as common law marriage. Um, no. You know, you have to, you're only going to be subject to the rules of dissolution and divorce. We call it dissolution in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we don't call it divorce um, like everyone else, but um, uh, you have to get married and you have, you know, there has to be a license and you have to be solemnized. sized. And so there's no such thing as a common law marriage. Um, and I know in your country that there's a couple of famous cases involving Middle Eastern, very wealthy Middle Eastern. Um, I think there was the owner of, was it Spurs or Arsenal? And he got married in his apartment in Knightsbridge. Mm -hmm. And then he said it hadn't, it wasn't a proper marriage mm -hmm. because they hadn't observed the formalities of the, mm -hmm. UK matrimonial law. I don't know what was, do you know the outcome of that case? Was it? No, but there's a similar situation with Mick Jagger um, and Jerry Hall. They married without the proper consents on a beach. Um, and he also claimed that they were not married. Um, and technically they weren't. It wasn't because, and, and neither would that football case because um, you need to go through the formalities. Um, we do quite a lot of recognition work and another feature that's recently sort of cropped up is lots of people got married in embassies thinking that the embassy was um only had to comply with the embassy's law so the the law of the country because they have this perception that it's a piece of their ground or something in england but that's not the case um you still have to marry in the in the formality of the english law so there's some interesting cases arising in relation to recognition um, and it's becoming very prolific um, and a very important topic for the Islamic community where many of the um, wives uh, in particular have not realized that they are not formally married in England and consequently if they separate they have very few rights. Cohabitees have very few rights in England um, we don't have de facto marriage, we don't have common law marriage, even though people use that phrase. 
basically we are like you we can use schedule one of the children act to build quite an extensive application for children's needs which might include housing lump sums um, housing until the child leaves and then it reverts to either the child or the, or the parent that's paid for it um, as well as I say quite quite significant lump sums carers allowance you know we try hard to find a way to give money if there is a big disparity in incomes but there is a lot of campaigning um, to give cohabitees more rights but of course where do you draw the line and that's been the issue you know what is a cohabitee and when do you start becoming entitled to equivalent of marital rights uh, and that's been on debate since I started uh, law which was a long time ago now about 25 25 years ago um, and it's it's not changed well uh, my understanding is um, that um, and one of the big difference with with American and California law is that if you uh, observe the formalities of marriage you go through you get a lot you get a marriage license and then you're, um, you participate in a ceremony which is solemnized um, mm -hmm. and you get the certificate, then you're married in the eyes of the law. And, and the courts generally will not look at um, minor lapses in, in those formalities to invalidate the marriage or make it void. If they do, then they might treat it as a putative marriage. Um, yeah. And then all the rights and obligations of the spouses are, are treated exactly the same. Yeah. But in England, my understanding is that there's a registry where there are certain places, if you want to get married in a certain place, whether it's a church or a, you know, a, a hall or somewhere, it has to be registered um, by the government or some yeah. aspect. Is it, has that true? To be, it has to be an authorised place um, or you have to have a registrar present. Um, and so without those formalities and at least two witnesses, I think it is, um, you will not be... Um, you will not be deemed validly married. Um, so this comes into play in England, but it also comes into play with um, other countries. So whereas English law might think that somebody isn't formally married, uh, particularly again, if we look at the Islamic community, commonly they will they will just have their religious ceremony and deem that to be enough. And obviously, in a Sharia country, that would be enough. Um, so England would recognise that marriage if it was made in a Sharia country, but it can't if it's made in England. So it, it's fascinating. Seems a bit unfair, I mean, doesn't it? The whole, the whole thing's fascinating. Um, international have you had those kind of cases? Have you had cases where women come in and say, and you have to tell a woman that she's, she's not technically or legally married? I mean, how, mm -hmm. what do you do? What do you I say? mean, it depends whether it's a technical issue or a fundamental issue as to whether her claims are severely impacted. Um, but... Um, yes, I mean, these things happen just as people that have got um, a premarital agreement from a European country, which they did together with a notary the day before they got married or on the morning of the marriage or a tick box to say that they're going to go for a certain regime. I have to say to them, no, you're not protected in England. That's not enough. Um, so there, this, is the, this is the nature of international work, as you all know, um, that you have so many disparities. Um, where you have these sort of people, you have these situations where people are coming to you and because they're not aware of these situations, they find that their rights are nothing like what they thought they were because their status has changed as they've, as they've changed borders. Um, so, I mean, that's what makes the work so interesting for us, but is also so complicated for clients to understand. So, yeah. Well, um, thank you so much, Lucy. It's been okay. very uh, illuminating, uh, very interesting. I'm, 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 I'm happy to be practicing in Los Angeles, and, uh, but I love, uh, I've loved practicing in London as well, and I hope to work with you or continue to work with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. If you just, we can see your, um, your um, at the back there, your website, that's iflg.uk.com. That's the one. Yeah. And you're a family a solicitor and I'm a family attorney. And so, again, uh, thanks uh, very much and uh, hope welcome. to work with you again soon. Thanks very much, Warren. Okay. Bye-bye.